Hi guys, so it's Dr. John back with the second part of Bob Dylan's 1965 interview in the conference hall in San Francisco. Uh, the first part was really interesting, so let's get back to it and see what he's saying in the second part. Well, at least my tea is fast. Okay, I'm going to see how long this lasts, and uh, if it doesn't last too long, then I'll continue. If not, you'll never see this because I'll cancel and do it again. It's very uh, irritating. Especially if you do it on the weekends. Do just one, they really have lots. Don't be a tosser. If it's not in the bin, it's on you. Okay. How would you define folk music? How would you define folk music? As a constitutional replay of mass production. Do you call your songs protest um, folk songs? No, no. Are protest songs folk songs? I guess if they're a constitutional replay of mass production. <laughs> Do you prefer songs with a subtle or obvious message? With a what? A subtle or obvious message. Uh, I don't really prefer those kind of songs at all. A message, you mean like, what song with a message? Well, like Eve of Destruction and things like that. Do I prefer that to what? I don't know, but your songs are supposed to have a subtle <coughs> message. A subtle message? <laughs> well, they're supposed to. <laughs> Where'd you hear that? <laughs> In a movie magazine. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, we, don't, we don't discuss those things here. Are your songs uh, ever about real people, like, you know, occasional poetry? Or... Sure they are. They're all about real people. Particular ones? <coughs> Particular people? Sure. I'm sure you've seen all the people in my scenes <coughs> at one time or another. Who's Mr. Jones? <laughs> Mr. Jones, I'm not going to tell you his first name. <laughs> I get sued. <laughs> what does he do for a living? He's a pin boy. <laughs> <laughs> he also wears suspenders. <laughs> Can you explain your uh, attraction <coughs> as a performer and a writer? Attraction to what? <laughs> your attraction. <laughs> your popularity, your mass popularity. No, no. I really have no idea. That's the truth. I always tell the truth. That is the truth. What are your own <laughs> personal hopes for the future, and uh, what do you hope to change in the world? Oh, my hopes for the future. I, to be honest, you know, I don't have any hopes for the future, and I uh, just hope to have enough boots to be able to change them. That's all, really. It doesn't boil down to anything more than that. If, there, if it did, I would certainly tell you. 
Chief, what do you think of a question and answer session of, uh, of this type with you as the principal well, subject? I think, I think we all have, we all have different, uh, I think I dropped an ash on myself somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you'll see in a minute here. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about it, though. Uh, I, uh, what was the question? <laughs> what are you thinking about right now? Thinking about this ash. <laughs> <laughs> right before that. Huh? This ash is creeping up on me somewhere. I've lost, lost touch with myself, so I can't tell where exactly it is. <laughs> Was that an inadvertent the evading of the question? Last year, Shen Yu... Everywhere. Don't miss your chance to experience... Okay guys, here we go again, so yeah, not much I can do about this, except stop the whole thing again. So I'm gonna just wait until it finishes. What does it take to be a Shenyun dancer? Usually two of them come up. It takes together. a mind. Sometimes of steel. they last a long time and sometimes they and don't. Lips of rubber. If I just stop it and start it again, it takes pushing the body to its limits. To know that the only limit hours, is in our minds. So it takes repeating the same the move end. over and over and over again. It takes facing your deepest fears to conquer them. Friday it takes night, falling yeah, over a hundred times. Always gets worse on Friday night. Only to get back up a thousand more. Though the journey may be long, the toughest challenges bring the greatest rewards. They need to delve into the past to inspire the future. You need a head devoid of doubt and heart full of humility. You need to learn to speak without saying a word. It takes knowing that greatness isn't achieved alone, but by the spirit of the team. It takes unfortunate truth, they, they make them so long. Tolerance. For the outer form embodies the inner spirit. Guess we get the free service, and we have to put up with these ads that nobody wants. Changing ourselves. <laughs> Change the world. I wonder about these guys. Do they really think that people want to see this? Do they think it sells their product? No matter what it takes, I doubt it is worth it. The skill level is beyond anything imaginable. Significant training. It's kind of interesting All of to these talk things about that coordinated together which, uh, to just display the utmost imprecision. Well, the sharpness and the quickness and the movement coming and going, and, going and then the scenery, the backdrop. Oh, I just love that. And their hands are so expressive in the way they use the props. There's nothing like that in Western uh, Delay. Yeah, they very much admire. They were extraordinary artists. They were so together and they were so focused on the audience and what they were doing. To be that exact height with the exact same movement and the exact same pose at the exact same time is another level of precision. What comes from the soul you can't fake and you can't practice. It just is. And so I loved that they explain what the name means and that it's the divine being expressing through their soul. Sensations. It's amazing. It's amazing. I've not seen anything like that in the theater. Every one of those dancers could be a... At least you can jump Tell ahead. Me, sir. Uh, you know, here, Fortunately, of course, because of the soft uh, show, uh, uh, kind of I think the, the wonderful you're doing is around the wall. Kind of
Our planet never ceases to amaze us. The best is always waiting to be discovered. Every corner hides unseen treasures that leave you spellbound. Be the first to witness a land of fascinating journeys. Where in the world could this be? Saudi, welcome to Arabia. Now that is interesting. Now, Saudi Arabia as a tourist destination. No, I didn't. I didn't. What you meetings of this kind, question and answer sessions? Oh no, no. I, I just know in my own mind that we all have uh, a different idea of all the words we're using. Uh, you know, so I don't really have too much. Uh, I really can't take it too seriously because we're reading. Like if I say the word house, like we're both going to see a different house. If I just say the word, right? So we're using all these other words like mass production and movie magazine, we all have a different idea of these words too, so I don't really know what we're saying here. What is, what do you point point right no, it's not pointless. If you, know, if, if you want to do it, you know, and you're there, you know, it's not pointless. I mean, no, it doesn't hurt me any. You just said it. Is there anything in addition to your songs that you want to say to people? Good luck. You don't say that in your songs, do you? Oh, yes, I do. Every song tails off with good luck. <laughs> I hope you make it. <laughs> um, what, what, why, uh, I couldn't hit the, most of what you Who are you? <laughs> Get the camera on this, uh, this person over here. <laughs> what do you bother to write the poetry for if we all get different uh, images? And we don't know what you're talking about Oh, because about I've anyway. got nothing else to do, man. <laughs> Huh? I didn't hear that. A rhyme for orange. <laughs> Just a, a rhyme for orange. Um, is it true that you were censored from singing on the Ed Sullivan show because they wouldn't let I'll you say what you wanted minute, to? Man. What? Did they censor you from singing what you wanted to on the Ed Sullivan show? Yes. It was a while, a long time ago. <laughs> what did you want to sing? I don't know. It was some song which I, I wanted to sing, and, and they said I could sing. It, it's more to it than just censorship there. They actually said I could sing the song, but uh, when we re went through the rehearsal of it, he came, guy came back afterwards and says that I, I said I have to change it. And he, and he said, can't you sing some folk song like, uh, like the Clancy Brothers do? <laughs> And, and I didn't know any of their songs, and so I couldn't be on the program. That's what it came down to. Have you found that the texts of the interviews with you, which have been published, are accurate to the actual conversations? No. No, that's, that's another reason for the... I don't really give press interviews or anything, because, you know, I mean, even if, if you do something, there are a lot of people here, so they know what's going on, but, like, if you just do it with one guy or a few guys, I just take it all out of context, you know. They just take it, uh, split it up in the middle, or just take what they want to use, and uh, they they even you they ask you a question and you answer it, and then it comes out in print that they just substitute another question for your answer. That makes you just sound like the way you, it's not really truthful, you know, to do that kind of thing. So I just don't do it. That's just a press problem there. You which think the entire text of your News conference today should be printed in the paper. Oh, no, no, nothing like that. No, nothing like that, but this is just for the interviews. You know, what, when they do want interviews in places like Omaha or in Cincinnati, man, you know. I don't, uh, I don't do it, and then they write bad things. Well, isn't this partly because uh, you're often inaudible, like for most of this dialogue or monologue, you have been inaudible, and now when you're touched personally by... Uh, the misquotation, your voice rises, and oh, we yeah. can hear you. Uh, yeah, well, I just realized that maybe the people in the back there can't yeah. hear me, that's all. I, I was going to ask you whether you're, you know, in your songs you sing out. Yes, pretty, I do. And whether in your uh, Well, the songs are what I do. You see, the, the songs, though, are, is what I do, yeah. is, is write the songs and sing them uh, and perform them. That, that's what I do. 
uh, the performing part of it could end. But like, uh, I'm going to be writing these songs and singing them <coughs> on records for, you know, I see no end right now. Uh, that, that's what I do. Uh, anything else is interferes with it. I mean, anything else trying to get on top of it, making something out of it, which it isn't, it just brings me down. And, and uh, it's not, it's not, it, it's just uh, makes it seem all very cheap. Well, it, it made me feel like you were almost doing a kind of penance of silence here. No, no. For the first no, I'm not part. one of those no? kind of people at all. You don't all. need silence. No, no silence. It's always silent where I am. <laughs> Mr. Dillon, when you're on a concert tour, how many people travel in your party? Do you travel alone or do you have a... We travel with about 12 people now. Uh, do the number of people seem to go with the amount of money you're making? Uh, uh, I didn't hear that. Do the number of people seem to increase as you make more money? This oh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Is that known as Dylan? Why do you need so many people when you travel? On <laughs> well, this we concert? have the band. We have we have uh, five in the group, and we need uh, other things. We have to. It's a lot of electronic equipment now, a lot of different things which have to be taken care of. So we need a lot of people. We have uh, three road managers, and uh, things like that. We don't make any big public presentations though. Like we never come into town in, in the limousines or anything like that. We just. Uh, go from place to place, you know, and do the shows, that's all. You fly in your own plane? Do you have a private yes. plane? Yes, yes. What? You have to get in a certain type of mood to write your music. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess so. A certain type of mood, if you want to call it do, that. Do you, find, do you find that you're perhaps more creative at a certain time of the day? Yes, yes, I feel that way. Like a night writer? I wouldn't say night has anything to do with it. No. Have you ever sung with the Beatles? No. no. Well, we, I think we may have messed around in London, but I don't, no, I don't think anything's serious. Are you ever to play a dance? Huh? Are you ever to play with people with dance? No. It's not that kind of music. It is. Well, what can I say? <laughs> you must know more about the music than, than I do. <laughs> How long have you been playing it? <laughs> uh, do you find that when you're writing, do you, uh, yes, yes. Do you find that when you're writing that you sort of free associate often? You just like no, it's all very clear and simple to me. These songs aren't complicated to me at all. I know what they, they all are all about. There's nothing hard to figure out for me. I, I wouldn't write anything I can't really see. I, I, don't, I didn't mean it that way. I meant that uh, when you're creating a song, are you doing it more or less at a, sort of a subliminal level, level where you're letting your mind just flow? No, my mind or feels you're, like that. You're very conscious of uh, each step, each word. No. No, that's the difference in the songs I'm writing, I write now in the past year or so. The last year and a half, maybe two, I don't know, but the songs before, up till uh, one of those records, I don't know, I wrote the fourth record in Greece. I was thinking so there was of that a change point, uh, there. But uh, the records before that, I used to know what I, I wanted to say before I used to write the song, you see. All the stuff which I had written before, which wasn't song, which is on a piece of you know, toilet paper when it comes out like that. That's the kind of stuff I never would sing because there, people would, uh, you know, I know people just would not be ready for it. But I just went through that other thing of writing songs, so, and uh, I couldn't write like it anymore. It was just too easy, and it wasn't really right. Uh, I would start out, I would know what I wanted to say before I wrote the song, and I would say it, you know. And it never really would come out exactly what, the, way, the way I thought it would, but it came out, you know, it touched it, you know. But now, I just write a song, you know, like I know that it's just going to be all right, you know. And, and I don't really know exactly what it's all about, but I do know the, uh, the minute and the, and the layers of uh, what it's all about. What do you think about your song, uh, It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding? That is to be my favorite one. <laughs> God bless you, son. <laughs> no, he I haven't heard it for a long time. I couldn't even sing it for you, probably. How long does it take you to write? Uh, it's usually not too long time, really. I might write all night 
and get one song out of a lot of different things I write. How many have I written? Uh, I guess, well, there's one publisher that's got about 100. I've written about 50 others, I guess. I got about 150 songs I've written. The, well, no, just n no. Some of the scraps haven't been published. But I find I can't really sing that anyway because uh, I forget it, you know. So the songs I don't publish, I usually do forget. Are you going to eventually take these scraps, as you call them, and make no, them into I've forgotten songs? No, I forgot scraps. I have to start over all the time. I, I can't really keep notes or anything like that. You can't go back to any earlier things no, and make no. them, use them in your... No, no, that wouldn't be right either. <coughs> yeah, if it happens, you know. That was a very, uh... Was, are you the same cat that was sitting over there? <laughs> <laughs> On your songs, do you get any help from uh, the rest of your... You know, your entourage? What? Do you get any help with uh, the group that you play with? Or do you write your songs? Uh, Robbie, you lead guitar player. Sometimes we play the guitars together. Something might come up where I know it's going to be right. Uh, we're just sitting around playing so I can write up some words. I don't get any ideas, though, to any kind of, uh, any kind of ideas of what I want to, you know, what's really going to happen here. <coughs> I don't know. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a newsman or anything. I'm not even a philosopher. I have no idea. I would think other people would know, but I don't think I know. You know, when you get too many people talking about the same thing, it tends to clutter up things. So I just... Everybody asks me that, so I realize they must be talking about it. So I, I, don't, I would rather stay out of it and make it easy for them. And when they get the answer, I hope they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been any more booing when you played electric? electric oh, there's guitar? booing. You can't tell where the booing's going to come up. Can't tell at all. <laughs> it comes up, comes up in the weirdest, strangest places. And uh, when it comes up, it's uh, quite a thing in itself. Uh, um, where is Desolation Row? I figure there's a little boo. In all of this. What? Now where is Desolation Row? I didn't hear you. Where is Desolation Row? Where? Yeah. Oh, that's someplace in Mexico. It's uh, across the border. <laughs> it's, it's noted for its Coke factory. <laughs> Coca-Cola machines uh, sells, sell a lot of Coca-Cola down there. Where's Highway 61? Highway 61 is, it, it exists. That's out in the middle of the country. It runs down to the south. Who's up north? Mr. Dillon, you seem very reluctant to talk about the fact that you're a popular entertainer and you're a most popular uh, entertainer. Well, what do you want me to say? Well, I don't understand why you. Uh, well, what do you want me to say? To, uh, do you want me to say uh, uh, who, who, what do you want me to say about it? Well, you seem to, almost embarrassed to admit that you're to talk about. Well, the I'm fact not embarrassed. I mean, popular. you know, uh, what, what do you want exactly me to say? Want me to jump up and say hallelujah and crash the cameras and do something weird? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. Tell me, I'll, I'll go along with you. If I can't go along with you, I'll find somebody to go along with you. Like, no, uh, but I, I find it, you really have no idea as to why you, or no thoughts on why you're popular. That's the, what enters me on. I just have no, I haven't really struggled for that. I, I don't, uh, it happened, you know? It happened like anything else happens. It's just a happening. You don't know, figure out happenings. You dig happenings, so I'm not going to talk Bob, about do it. Do you feel that part of the popularity is because of an identification uh, of your audience with you or with what you're saying or what you've been writing about? I have no idea. I don't really come too much in contact. Does it make life more difficult? No, it certainly doesn't. Were you surprised the first time the booze came? Yeah, they were. That was at Newport. Well, I went. I did this very crazy thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, I didn't really know what was going to happen, but uh, they certainly booed. I'll tell you that. 
you'd hear it all over the place. I don't know who they were though, and I'm certainly they made they whoever it was did it you know loud twice as loud as they normally would. They kind of quieted <laughs> down some at Forest Hills, although they they did it there too. They've done it just about all over, except in Texas, and uh, they didn't boo us in Texas or in uh, in uh, Atlanta or in Boston and in, or in Ohio. They've done it just about, or in Minneapolis they didn't do it there, but they've done it a lot of other places. I mean, they must be pretty rich to be able to go someplace and boo. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, uh, other I, if I couldn't afford it if I was in their shoes. Other than the booing, have the audience has changed? I mean, do you get screaming, do you get people rushing to the stage? No, the oh, sometimes and... you get people rushing to the stage, but you just, you know, turn them off very fast. Kick them uh, in the head or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> they get the picture. Going back to uh, what you said a minute ago about not really being concerned and not really knowing uh, why you uh, are in the midst of this popularity, that's in direct opposition to uh, what most uh, people who reach this level of popularity say, and I well, am popular you because see, a lot they of people, feel with me. A lot so of people start out and they try to try to be stars. I would imagine, like, however they have to be stars. I mean, I know a lot of those people, you know? And they start out and they go into show business for many, many reasons to be uh, seen, you know? Uh, I started out, you know, like, I, this was, had nothing to do with it when I started. I started from New York City, you know? And uh, there just wasn't any of that around. Yeah. It just happened, you know, so... Uh, don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I agree with your right not to have to care. My, my, my point is that uh, it would be somehow uh, somewhat disappointing to the many people who think that you feel towards them the way they feel towards you. And that's the reason for your popularity. That's what oh. they think. Well, I don't want to disappoint anybody. I mean, tell me what I should say. <laughs> Good. I'm with you. Huh? Fine. You know, I'll, I'll certainly go along with anything. But... <laughs> It's, uh, I really don't have much of an idea. You have a poster there, is that an old Yes, it's a poster somebody gave to me. I, it looked I did. good. <laughs> Jefferson Airplane, John Handy, Quintet, and Sam Thomas, and Mystery Trend, and the Great Society are all playing fr at Fillmore Auditorium <laughs> Friday, December 10th, and I would like to go if I could. <laughs> 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 But unfortunately, I'm, I won't be here, I don't think, but uh, if I was here, I, should, I certainly would be there. Do you tour in the South? Yeah. What's more important to you, uh, the, the way that your music and words sound, or the content, the message of the work? The, the whole thing while it's happening, the, the whole total sound of the words, uh, what's really going down is, is uh, it, it, it either is, it either happens or it doesn't happen, you know? That's what I feel is, just, just the thing which is happening there at that time, that's, the, that's, the, that's what, what, what's, that, what's what we do, you know? That is the most important thing, there really isn't anything else. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, you mean it, it might happen one time and might not happen oh, the yeah, next time with the same song. Oh, yeah, we've you know. But, uh... Well, we always take good cuts for the record. The records are always made on good cuts, and... In person, it just... Most of the time, it does come across. Most of the time, we do feel like, you know, playing. Uh, That's important to me. The aftermath, or whatever happens before and after, is not really important to me. Just the time on the, st on the stage and the, and the time <coughs> that we're singing the songs and performing them. Or not really performing them, even just letting them be there. Bob, we promised to spring you at a certain yeah, time, which is now, it's now two o'clock. Okay. That's Thank you very much. All right. I'd like to, incidentally, to suggest that Mary Ann Pollard explain the... Uh,
all sellouts, Marianne, or what is the thing? <laughs> no, not quite. Bob Dylan's press conference was videotaped in the studios of KQED San Francisco on Friday, December 3rd, 1965. Okay, so that's about it. Um, yeah, Bob relaxed a lot in the second part of the interview, I think. He was more at home, a lot more nervous and wary in the first part. Um, some interesting issues that he touched on here. For me, the most interesting section was probably where he was talking about he didn't like talking a lot in... Uh, to journalists and in conferences because everybody kind of misunderstood what he was saying most of the time. Anyway, he gives the example of if I say house, the house I see is not the same as the house, the house that you see and that all these words we use, they all mean different things to different people. So there's confusion going on all the time with people misunderstanding each other and that's kind of behind why people get misreported all the time. This is a very interesting and very sophisticated point. It's really uh, at the center of linguistic philosophy. Things that people like uh, logical positivists and Ludwig Wittgenstein were talking about the way that people use language in different ways. And there's always a uh, misunderstanding because people are missing things when they use words. When people use words, they use them as they want to use them. And the message that they give to somebody else uh, is received in the way that the receiver interprets them. So, yeah, language can be a means of miscommunication. Of course, we, we kind of uh, know that most of the time people will get what we mean in terms of the simple concepts but as soon as we start making what we say more complex more complicated interpretation then becomes much more important and people see things and interpret words in entirely different ways so uh, yeah that's an important point for a linguistic philosopher it's also an important point for a poet as well because Poet, as Bob Dylan said one time, uses words like a mathematician uses numbers. And uh, yeah, he is able to see all those ambiguities of language, the ways in which the words can mean so many different things, and actually turn them to his use. And um, that makes him a better poet. He can, he can work in all the ambivalencies and the ambiguities, and it gives more power, strength, and depth to what he's saying. It's a different kettle of fish entirely when you're talking to journalists and you want to say something straight and be understood. Um, yeah, so in, in other words, it's a natural state of language to be misunderstood to some extent. But on the other hand, a poet can use those kind of uh, strange qualities of language to actually make what he writes, he or she writes, more profound and having more depth so he doesn't maybe make it explicit but I think that's a point that's a point he's making again it comes across just how interested he is in the his art of writing when people are asking him questions about how he how he writes he's quite happy to to give the best the best answers he can um, but when there is a, a question comes in, which is very, very general. The who is Mr. Jones, or where is Desolation Row? He retreats into sarcasm and cynicism. After the question about Desolation Row, uh, somebody asks about Highway 61, and he says, oh, that's a real place. So we can assume that what he said about Desolation Row being in Mexico uh, was not true. And... Uh, he was irritated by the fact that obviously desolation row is some kind of mental mental state, some kind of mental place, um, not like Highway 61, which is real. 
So he's great when it comes to saying real things, talking about real things relating to his art, but he doesn't want uh, superficial questions that ask things like where is Desolation Row or who is Mr. Jones because this trivializes his art and any artist would feel exactly the same. When the guy, the journalist, starts uh, upbraiding him for not being interested in why he's famous, he, he, he says, well, there are lots of people who are stars who started out with the intention of becoming famous and they can certainly answer questions like that, but it was never my intention to become famous, it just happened. So uh, I have no idea why people like me. I didn't, in other words, he's saying he, he didn't change what he does does to be popular. He didn't change what he did to be popular. It just happened. He did what he wanted to do, <coughs> what he thought was right for him and his art, and people tuned into it and liked it, and it was an accident. That's what, he, that's what he's saying. Whether it's entirely true or not, I don't know. It's... Uh, He's certainly a great artist, so I think that he did start with his own vision and people obviously did tune into it, but uh, some people argue, well, those early protest songs and then the sudden change to not really wanting to do that anymore and uh, become a rock artist uh, showed that he was actually um, someone who was always thinking about how he could get on to the next main chance, but another way of seeing it is just that it's progress. It's, it's not everybody who's going to be happy just singing protest songs all their life, and uh, Dylan was someone who needed to move on to other things. And he, would, uh, yeah, he, he was interested in developing his arts, and he didn't think he could do it by just staying inside the, the folk music genre. Um, so I I can only give my own take on this. I think that he was, uh, what he's saying is true. He started as a folk artist around the, the clubs in Greenwich Village in New York. And uh, when he started, I'm sure he had no idea that he was going to become as famous as Elvis Presley or the Beatles. And uh, he was just trying to make a living at something he, he enjoyed doing. But the quality of his music and his words, they were so high, it was so high that uh, it just took off. The time was right, he was the right person in the right place at the right time. And uh, yeah, he became incredibly famous without really having started by wanting to be a star. It probably would have gone in a different direction than folk artists playing in small clubs with an acoustic guitar if he wanted to be very, very famous. And probably he would have taken a different direction. So I think we can accept that from Bob. Um, and yeah, the, the, the difference between the journalists asking, quest asking the questions and Bob seems to have diminished somewhat by the end. There is obviously a lot of admiration for Bob there because uh, his records are already incredibly famous. Everybody knows that nobody writes words like he does. And he may, it's interesting, the dichotomy between this guy who's so taciturn and says so little at the front and the knowledge that this is the same guy who's, who's uh, beating out these songs like Like a Rolling Stone, Positively Fall Street with all these incredible lyrics piling up on images up on top of each other. So that the difference between the uh, reluctant speaker in front of them and what they know is on his records is, is powerful in the room. Most of them will probably have heard his records and uh, they will feel the difference between this, this figure in front of them who says so little and the wordsmith on the records who files image on image on image. Um, yeah, so I think that we can discover a lot about Bob in this in this interview. Um, if he doesn't want to say something, he won't say it, and that's because he wants to protect his art. He sees his art as the highest 
thing of all. He, he doesn't tolerate fools gladly, and especially foolish journalists and foolish questions about his songs. Um, but he welcomes sensible questions about how he works and, and what he likes. He's wary of the journalists because he knows that they are making a living the best way they can and they're probably going to go back and write whatever they want and any, what, whatever he says can be twisted to, uh, to what they want to say and even quotes can be included out of context as well to give the wrong idea. So he's well aware of what journalists do and there is a, a wariness from him and from the journalists there is that sense of, well, we are older than him, uh, we are more worldly probably, uh, why is he so popular, maybe we can, maybe we can uh, fool him in some way and ask questions that he won't be able to cope with and he'll contradict himself and uh, that will be kind of amusing. So there is an element of conflict there through, through, through the whole interview. So I think this is a, an interview that will really tell people who want to listen a lot about Bob Dylan, how he writes, what he thinks is important about his art and the things he, he doesn't want to, to talk about and the reasons why he wouldn't want to say anything about those things. Uh, and by taking this in, we can come to a good understanding a, a good understanding of of how Bob wrote in the earlier days at least and of course he was to progress uh, far more than this in the future uh, nearly ten years later he would produce what in my opinion was his masterpiece Blood on the Tracks and uh, even after that there were other great great albums Desire Infidels, Love and Theft, Oh Mercy, so many of them. He got the Nobel Prize and, and he deserved it. And uh, maybe he's the greatest living poet. It's quite happy to entertain that idea. So I hope you enjoyed this interview with Bob Dylan in the early days and my reaction and analysis of it. So, thanks a lot. See you next time. Remember to subscribe and like this video.